Yeah. Alright, hey guys. So I'm teaching class today. Yeah. And, uh, if I go too fast, please tell me to slow down, okay? Uh, in he will go too fast, so be ready. Yeah, in fifth period, this took the whole class and it wasn't supposed to. So hopefully we'll get through all of it today. Alright, so we're going to go over some 2D kinematics. Um, we're going to talk about all of these things today. So, yeah. Okay. All right, and before we get started, I have a little activity for you guys to do. Okay. So, exhibit A. Okay. Look at it. And then we have exhibit B. Oh, I love Fortnite. Okay. All right. So what I just showed you, a Nerf bow and arrow, a cannon, these two video game <laughs> guns, it wasn't just to show you guys, hey, I'm very cool. There's a reason. So I now have to ask you guys, what stayed the same between these two exhibits? Okay, they're both projectiles. Great. Now what changed? What changed between these two? Okay, great. Anyone else? Let me show up the last video. Nope. That's not enough. Not quite. There we go. Yeah. All right. So between these two, okay, they so they all shoot something out of their bar uh, their barrels, right? They're all projectiles, and of course each one's different from the era. Now, how do you think this relates to what we're learning in physics one? What's the old one? Like it's the old one. Well, make sure I let me make sure I got that for you. <laughs> well, what, what's the why do I show you this? What's the reason? Because you can use her physics is like an old concept. People use it like a while ago. Okay, not quite. But so, what do so what do all of these simplified down to a cannon, an arrow? They're all projectiles. At the most basic level, they're all going to be just simple projectiles, which means that we can calculate everything about them. We can calculate time, distance, travel, highest point, launch velocity, and launch angle and launch velocity. Now, so does can anyone tell me why is it important to study projectiles? Not just only in AP Physics 1, but in real life. Why do people dedicate their time studying about how things move or in the air? Who has an answer? No. Not quite. There you go. Rockets, right? We want to go into space. What else? Yeah, we can improve the effecti effectiveness of weapons, right? So, if you know anything about history, we, uh, wars, battles, all these things are the greatest catalyst to technolog technological advancement. If we think back to World War I, how many things that we developed just for that one war, right? So, the importance, one of the importance is that well, um, studying projectiles allows us to create modern day weapons that are really effective, really accurate, and really powerful, and can go far distance. And of course, in video game design, right? Real, uh, real physics in video game design is also an important reason why people study such topics. And yeah. So now let's go over some terminology. Just like every other science course and in physics itself, ballistics and projectiles has their own terminology we must understand before we start diving into practice problems and conceptual questions. And so here's the diagram, and we'll start with, first you have a projectile, which is the object that's being launched, okay? And a projectile will have the height, which is the vertical displacement at any given time, the maximum height, which is the vertical displacement when the velocity, the vertical velocity equals zero, or the highest point of the trajectory, the trajectory, which is the path which the projectile takes, the range, which is a horizontal displacement at any given time, and a maximum range. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, good. This will be uploaded in the It'll be uploaded, guys. We're good. Right. 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 All right, let's move on now. So, what I this diagram is uh, specifically is a diagram of a clip question. What we say is that the initial position is higher than the final position. But of course, that's not the only thing you'll see on the AP exam. There are a couple more things we are gonna sh I'll show you. And all of these are solved the same way. Projectiles in general have the exact same approach to solving them, but each scenario has a little difference. Launch angle, initial velocity, or what you have to think about. So at first, rolling off a cliff. If you have a cliff and Bill rolled a ball off it, launch angle will be zero degrees, which means when you divide the components, the horizontal velocity will be and the vertical will, will be going at zero degrees. The vertical velocity will be what? Yeah. Zero. Okay, so that's what you have to think about. It's gonna start, basically when you're solving the vertical side of the projectile, you're gonna think of that starting from rest. And then you have what we have launched off a cliff. Now there's two sets of examples here. First, you have launched upwards and launched downwards. Now here we have to think about the signs of the degree. If you're launching downwards, you're gonna put when you put, uh, put it into the function, theta is going to be negative. And if you're doing upwards, theta is going to be positive. Make sure you don't mix these two up, because if you do, you're going to get completely different answers, okay? And next we have the, uh, when you launch a projectile, the launch height and the landing height is exact same. You're launching on a flat surface. And of course, y, not, uh, y uh, final and y initial are going to be the exact same. And finally, we have launch and lands at the top of a hill. Now this one, you're, you, it's like you're at the bottom of a cliff and you need to throw something up to your friend at the top of the cliff. And that's, that's why I, I know it will be higher than Y initial. Okay. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about launch angles. Now the most optimal angle, which means you're going to get equally great at great range and great cell uh, and great height is going to be 45 degrees that will give you the longest range and the um, tallest height without sacrificing one for the other and the condition for 45 degrees is there has to be a flat surface launch height and um, landing height have to be the same if it's different if you're throwing it off a cliff or throwing it up towards a cliff it's going to be different launch angles okay Make sure that it's the same launch and landing height. That's the very that's very important. And of course, we have complementary launch angles, which means um, two angles that will add up to ninety degrees. Well, um, basically, let's take an example for. Uh, let's take an example. You have a launch angle of thirty degrees and sixty degrees. They're complementary, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what um, what that means is that the range of a sixty degree launch angle and the uh, height of a 30 degree launch angle is going to be the same and the height of a 60 degree launch angle and a range of a 30 degree launch angle is the same. Now why is that? We can turn to our great friend trigonometry. So I take for example sine of 60. What's sine of 60? Okay, now what's uh, cosine of 30? Right, so now you understand how these complementary angles work. If you get this in the FRQ, you'll understand how to explain complementary angles and how they work, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah? And up to this point, does anyone have any questions for me for the past couple slides we've just done? Is everyone still on, the, still on track with me? No? All right, I'm gonna go on now. So what exactly is a projectile? I just explained to you it's an object that is launched. It has a height, maximum height range, maximum range, and a trajectory. But there's a couple more things that a projectile has that we need to talk about before we apply them. So first, a projectile is an object that's free to travel. What do I mean by that? Nothing is touching the projectile while it's in motion. Basically, like you can't, like you can't be pushing something like through the air, that's not called a projectile. If you're like fly, uh, holding a paper airplane while you're running around, that's not a projectile. Um, but now that might uh, arise, uh, arise a question, then if you can't touch it during its motion, how does it start? 
Now, a projectile can have a force to get a star moving. If you think about a bow and an arrow, when you knock up, when you knock the bow back, the string is going to apply tension force to get that arrow moving. But that arrow becomes a projectile once it leaves the bow and it's flying through the air by itself. And no other forces than gravity can act on the object during its motion. Gravity goes 9.8 uh, meters per second and it affects the uh, vertical velocity, right? And so a couple of examples are a space shuttle is a projectile while it's orbiting around the Earth, but it's not a projectile while it's getting launched into the atmosphere. There's a force propelling it upwards and it's not a projectile at that moment. A couple more examples, projectiles, you can think bullets, cannonballs, baseballs, and mortar rounds while they're in the air. Not projectiles, missiles, and rockets will not be projectiles ever because, or in theory ever, because it's always getting propelled by a source, a fuel source. It's always going to have a force applied to it. And for gliders and frisbees, um, they're a special, uh, they're like a special circumstance, a special group of things that fly in the air in which that we can't ignore air resistance and aerodynamics. If we were to do this in a vacuum chamber, which would be our ideal world, when you throw a glider out, when you're going through a glider or you're using frisbees, what's going to happen? You're just gonna fall right down. Then we can change the name of gliders to pieces of metal, and we can change frisbee to lumps of plastic, right? So for these two, we're never going to be able to ignore air resistance. That's always gonna be a, um, a dominant reason of how they, how they move through the air. So that's that. And of course, to keep things simple, we're gonna assume that air resistance, aerodynamics are all negligible unless stated specifically in the question. If, they don't, if the question never says something about air resistance, we're not gonna worry about it in AP Physics 1, okay? And now let's go on to some central ideas. So these three ideas are the biggest propellers of uh, projectiles. Number one, it is critical to split the problem apart and think about each, um, think about the projectile horizontally and vertically um, by themselves, okay? Take velocity, if you're given a velocity with the launch angle of theta, split them into two. Have the horizontal component and the vertical component, component of it before you start solving, okay? The two, Two biggest concepts are vertical motion of a projectile doesn't affect its horizontal, and the horizontal one doesn't affect the vertical, okay? We will also call this, if you see this in a multiple choice, it might be called, they're independent of each other, okay? As you saw in the demonstration Ms. B gave to you yesterday with the ball, one being pushed out, one being dropped, right? They fall at the same time, despite one being launched out at an angle, right? So they're all independent of each other. The vertical, they drop at the same time. The vertical ones are, while working by themselves and the horizontal components are working by themselves, okay? And next, we have a couple more principles. So of course, horizontal, the displacement horizontally, we call that the range. And there's no acceleration in the horizontal component, component of the projectile. So we call that zero. There's no acceleration, velocity is constant. Vertically, the displacement, we call it the height. And there is a force, that force being the force of gravity on Earth. G will equal 9.81 on Earth, and that's the force that is uh, making the projectile go downwards. Okay, next we have a couple of equations to go through. Now these equations are all your very basic kinematics equation, except they have a couple of subscripts on them tailored to which, um, which component they're using. So for horizontal equation, we have range, displacement, and velocity. Now for range, this is your most common equation you're gonna use, R equals box T V naught times T. Okay, and then you have displacement. Now the displacement is basically the, the range plus an initial position if you have an initial position. Typically we don't use a displacement equation, but sometimes you might be asked like something is flying out, uh, uh, Bill knocked an arrow and at one second he decided to start recording and he stopped, uh, stopped uh, recording a stopwatch six seconds later. How far did the projectile move during those six seconds? You might need to apply displacement formula for that. But typically, most FRQs will just ask you, what's the range of a projectile with the maximum range? That's R equals box T. And finally, velocity. Remember, velocity, uh, uh, horizontal component has no acceleration. So velocity is the same throughout the entire tra um, uh, path of motion, okay? And of course, the horizontal components calculated by D cosine theta. And now we have some vertical equations. 
We have, two, we have three of them, one for height and two for the velocity. So for height, that's just a second kinematic equation um, remodeled a little to be specific for vertical motion. So like one change is you have uh, in the normal one on your formula sheet, it will say plus one half at squared. But in projectiles, we'll move, change that to minus one half gt squared. And the reason being is that if you have one half a t squared, the a in vertical motion is negative 9.8, right? It's going downward, so it's negative, and due to a, a gravity, it's 9.8. So we have negative one half gt squared. You see where I get that from. All right, and for velocity, we have the <coughs> first kinetics equation, I believe, and the third one. And so, of course, just like the first one, you have minus g instead of plus a, because that just makes it a lot simpler to do in projectile motion. And you know, y, uh, y component is v sine of theta. All right, now we're gonna start moving into some problems. So first, the problem solving steps. The approach that I want you to take is this. First, draw a diagram. If you're given a word problem in an FRQ, or even a multiple choice and it doesn't come with a diagram, draw your own so it's easier to understand what's going on in the problem. And then split the diagram into their components. If you have a velocity and an angle, you have to split those into their vertical and horizontal components. It makes it, easy, it, makes it easier to solve the problem. Third, you want to create a table. Now has Mr. Yu shown you how to solve a projectile? Right, she had to create two tables. That was a great way to keep everything organized in your problem. So you want to create two tables, one for horizontal and one for vertical, and then you want to choose equations out of the six equations I gave you to solve for what you don't know. See what you already have and see what you don't know and pick equations to solve for what you don't know and solve for the unknown variable. Now I have to say, typically, we'll solve for the vertical column first and then the horizontal, and you'll see why in a moment. But keep in mind that generally you might want to start with the vertical side first, but not always, it always depends on the problem, but yeah. And so first we have problems doing velo dealing with velocity. So first let's do a practice question. Grab your calculators out. Yep. And suppose the ball was fired at a velocity of 30.0 meters per second at an angle of 35 but above the horizontal. Calculate both components of velocity. All right, we should have an answer by now. What's the horizontal component? What? 24 point something, okay, what's the vertical? All right, great. Yep. So that's how you solve for it, really simple. And now, these are the initial velocities if you split them into components. Now I have a couple questions about these two numbers. Which velocity component remains constant? And now, which one changes, and by how much? All right, great. And now, follow-up question. What will be the components of the velocity when t equals 2.5 seconds? All right, horizontal component. Right, doesn't change. Vertical. Awesome. There we go. That's how you do it. Of course, horizontal, the acceleration is zero, so it doesn't change. It will never change. I can ask you, is the component, well, of course, it'll go back to zero when it hits the ground, but if I ask you for any point in time, it'll be zero. 